morning, welcome. Come on in, grab a seat. Thank you for that, Skylar. How's everybody today? Thank you. Hey, welcome to our uh, Spartan Speaker Series for this month. This is the last one for uh, this semester. Uh, yes, it is, but uh, we're excited for our guests today. Uh, just a reminder, we will have chapel again on Thursday, so we hope to see you back on Thursday. Uh, we'll continue in our series called Bad Religion, explore, exploring a number of ideas uh, that uh, give Christianity a, a bad rap and how uh, we can think through those things from a biblical pers perspective and what Jesus is calling us to in the day to day. For our speaker series today, I'm excited to uh, welcome uh, John Hendricks. John is a New York Times bestselling illustrator and author of many uh, children's books, uh, including Drawing is Magic, John Brown and His Fight for Freedom, The uh, Miracle Man, The Story of G uh, Jesus, and The Faithful Spy, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and The Plot to Kill Hitler. His work has appeared in a number of publications like Newsweek, Sports Illustrated, Entertainment Weekly, Rolling Stone, National Geographic, and Time Magazine, just to name a few. Uh, he is a professor at Wash U right down the road from our institution, and so we're thankful that he would take time out of his schedule to come and spend some time with us as he reflects with us on art and beauty and vocation. Would you all give a good MBU welcome to John Hendricks today? Hello. Hi. How are you? Well, my name is John. I think we covered that. So I'm an artist. Uh, I'm a writer. I'm an illustrator. So today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about, of course, my work um, and about the idea of vocation. And we're going to go to art school uh, for just a little bit. So a lot of people feel like this is kind of a loaded term sometimes to be able to say, I'm an artist. You know, a lot of people don't know if they're allowed to call themselves um, an artist. You know, sometimes it feels like you have to make your entire living from art in order to be an artist. Um, but personally, I just make stuff. I think that's a better way to think of yourself of if you are an artist. In fact, I think all of you are artists. We all make stuff. If you're making food, <laughs> if you're working in your garden, uh, if you're doing your homework, uh, that might not be art. But um, anyway, I think everyone should claim the term, I'm a maker. So I want to talk a little bit about vocation, because my vocation actually is that I'm an artist. But that's different than the way we think about other jobs. Or it's like sometimes art sits outside of like real careers, or at least I get that a lot. Or if I'm in a Christian worldview, sometimes people are like, how is your art like helping Jesus? Even though we don't ask plumbers to like, you know, create the pipes into like the shape of Jesus' name in order to justify their work. So like if you think about your job, that's kind of any paid position. If you think about a career, that's a series of jobs that kind of continue upward and then maybe they kind of hit a plateau. But then there is calling. And calling, I like this word, is work that flows from, expresses, and deepens our identity. A calling is a contribution to society, a labor that makes our lives better. And actually, I think a calling doesn't mean a privileged, high-paid, super job. A calling can be lots of things. For me, a calling is to make kind of doodles, honestly. I mean, when people say, what do you do? Well, I'm kind of a professional doodler. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm very lucky. Let me read you this uh, quote. It's a little long, but it's from George MacDonald. And I love what it says about our calling. And just one note, this was written in the 19th century, so anytime you see man, just imagine humankind, all right? I don't want it to be gendered. As the fir tree lifts up itself with a far different need from the need of the palm tree, so does each man stand before God and lift up a different humanity to the common Father. And for each, God has a different response. With every man, he has a secret. 
the secret of a new name. In every man there is a loneliness, an inner chamber of peculiar life into which only God can enter. Now, here's the best part. For this, it follows that there is a chamber also, a chamber in God himself into which none can enter but the one, the individual, the peculiar man, out of which chamber that man has to bring revelation and strength for his brethren. This is that for which he was made, to reveal the secret things of the Father. I love this idea that if God has made you to be individual, there must be some individual singular thing about you that only God can see, and that inner chamber is yours to enter and to participate in. And that can be in family, that can be in friendship, and that can also be in our work. So, of course, I am called, I think, to be an artist. And I want to show you a little bit about what that really means. In fact, actually, this is kind of interesting. There are two views of vocation. If we can just like, this is very broad, okay? This is a broad view of these two views that Martin Luther and John Calvin had about what vocation was. Martin Luther felt like you serve where we are, like wherever your feet are, that is where God has placed you, so we use our gifts in that place. Whereas John Calvin said, we discern what our gifts are, and then we find a place we can use them. Those actually may sound very similar, but they're actually completely opposite views, and they're both valid. That's why it's so hard when we think about what our calling is in our work and what God is asking us to do. How, how exactly do we do that stuff? And so this is the question I ask a lot. What exactly should my art be doing? What should our work be doing? So when you think about what are your theories, you're like, where's the art? I, I thought this was about art. The theories of the way that you make things, the way that your work works are actually important. Um, I just wanna give you a couple examples because I think these are interesting. For me, here's one theory. The way I serve God in art making is to evangelize the secular world. Sure, that's, that's one way you could think about a theory. Or the second one, the main way to serve God in art making is worship and adorn God and help others to do the same. You know, maybe that's like worship music or liturgical art. Or maybe the main way to serve God in art making is by working from a Christian motivation to glorify God by shaping and impacting our culture. These all seem great. The main way to serve God, theory four, is just by simply doing excellent and skillful work or maybe by furthering social justice, or by just creating beauty. Maybe by doing what gives you the greatest sense of joy and satisfaction. Or maybe just by making as much money as possible and giving as much of it away. Or if maybe your field is not money, if your field is capital, or influence by using that influence in a positive way. Okay, so now I've just given you eight possible ways to think about what work really means. None of these are the right way. These are all ways to see the stuff that you make and why it's important. Now, I love this quote from Wendell Berry. The significance and ultimately the quality of the work we do is determined by our understanding of the story in which we are taking part. That story is really important. Okay, so we all know that I have to pick one of these. I can't be both, right? Well, okay, so you know that's not true. But you probably, part of you is like, well, you can either be a good Christian or a good artist. You really can't be both of those at the same time, right? Because you're like, you're thinking, I've seen Christian art. There's no possible way that this could be good. <laughs> of course, this could apply to science. It could apply to law could apply to athletics. Is it really possible to be good and true at both of these things at the same time? Well, I mean, back when I was about your age, I was really thinking about this question. What kind of art can a Christian make? What, what art am I allowed to make? And as I've gotten older, that's changed. I've realized there's certain things that I must make. Now, of course, a lot of that, maybe you're thinking, he's gonna draw books about Jesus. And actually, I would have spent the first part of my career telling you, 
Christian artists should not make books about Jesus. They should make books about other things because the world is a huge place. But of course, I do have a book about Jesus. I'm sorry. It's actually, it's very interesting. I took the idea of Jesus speaking. You know, in the Bible, we see the red words of Jesus. And I had this idea that what if the words in a picture book came alive and interacted with the space around Jesus, just physically, the type came to life. Or maybe this, uh, this is a piece I did for Christianity Today about a visual translation of the first chapter of John, when the word became flesh. So apparently I only draw spiritual things. Or sometimes I do work for editorial venues. This was for the Wall Street Journal. Um, oh shoot, that was a video. Well, this is me, imagine me drawing this. This was about a family that went ab abroad during the pandemic and how crazy their trip was. Sometimes it's advertising, this was for ESPN, and this was originally a, a magazine ad that eventually I did not realize was going to be turned into uh, a 60 foot high billboard next to Madison Square Garden, absolutely insane. Uh, sometimes my work is magazine covers, communicating ideas. Uh, sometimes it's reportage, which is this fancy word that means someone calls me to go on site and to report what I see to both write and draw at the same time. This was for the New York Times about uh, Cahokia and my experiences there. Some of my work is about stories. This is an incredible set of middle grade novels called uh, Ronan Boyle, written by Thomas Lennon. He's a, a legit famous person. You probably know him from Reno 911. Uh, he's Lieutenant Dangle uh, with the very short shorts. He is an absolute hilarious person. And if, you, if you get these books, of course I want you to buy the print version because you can see my drawings, but the real, the best part of these books is the audio because he does all the voices for these books. And of course, I do picture books. Now, I have done books about Jesus and Jesus' parables, uh, but also stories from history, like the story of John Brown, who was an abolitionist who actually hated slavery so much, he tried to single-handedly end slavery uh, in 1859, and it did not go well for him. But I actually think he's much more of a civil rights hero than we give him credit for. He was way ahead of the idea of, uh, on race than Lincoln, in fact. A very interesting study. Or The Christmas Truce, a story about what happened in World War I when the French and the Germans began to sing Christmas carols together on Christmas Eve and decided that they didn't want to fight in a war anymore. And also I've made just tons of, tons of images for publications, for magazines, for websites, for books, all orbiting things that I'm interested in drawing, that I love to think about. In recent years, my work has gone into books and graphic novels. This story is a long form graphic novel about Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Dietrich was a pastor and theologian in Germany, and he participated in a plot to try to assassinate Hitler. My newest book I've been working on for about five years. <laughs> I just finished it. This cover is like hot off the press. Uh, it'll be out next fall. It's about the friendship between C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien called The Myth Makers. And really it's a book about why we tell myths as humankind and why fairy tales exist. And in fact, their friendship is a really interesting lens into why our work gets better when we are in fellowship and why we tell stories to begin with. So I'm very excited about that. And this, oh, shoot, that is a, oh, guys, trust me, this is an amazing video that we, did, we couldn't make work. But I make a collection of comics about a little blue ghost uh, who's actually um, the Holy Spirit. Believe it or not, this is what he looks like. You've probably never thought to yourself, what does the Holy Spirit look like? Well, he's a little blue ghost. And he hangs out with uh, a squir squirrel and a badger and they, uh, <laughs> they have a great time together talking about art. Uh, let me read you some comics here. Whoa, I love all your artwork. Well, I hate them. Derivative, uninspired, fraudulent, well-crafted, but unremarkable. I may have okay ideas, but they're never great. Oh. 
So why do you keep making so many? Hmm. Well, I guess not making them is slightly worse than hating them. That's basically how I feel most of the time I leave my drawing table. All right. Can we go to art school for a minute? I know that I'm showing you illustration, but I really want to talk about how we think about art. What is art exactly? I bet you have had the experience of walking into an art museum and basically going into a room. Art museums, you realize, are fabrications of society. Those aren't like naturally occurring in the world. So the idea that you walk into a white room that's filled with paintings that you imagine must be important. Why would they be here if they were not important? These must be works of genius. You look at them, you have no idea what to make of them, and you know what you do? You, you look at it for 10 seconds, maybe, maybe 10 seconds. Then you read the label, and then you walk into the next room. This is everyone's experience with going to a museum. So let's go back in time and see if this can help you think about art in a different way. Let's go back to 17... 21. And you see this, sitting in a gallery. No, of course not. There's no galleries in 1721. This is what art was. This is decoration. This is beauty. This is a beautiful cabinet that has been adorned for the enjoyment of people around. If we go up 100 years into the future, what would, what would a person think art is in that age? Well, it might have been like a history painting, something that represented a story, something we needed to tell, to pass along, a visual representation of, of some kind of narrative. And then we go up 100 years later, and you see <laughs> in a gallery, now the galleries exist, an upside-down urinal that is signed by someone named R. Mutt. Now, this urinal, you may not realize it, has wedged its way into your subconscious without knowing it. This by Marcel Duchamp was the idea of a ready-made. He took something in the world, turned it upside down, and put it in a gallery and said, this is art. He decided that art making was not craft and beauty, but the idea itself. The will of the artist is the art. And unfortunately, this urinal has led you to believe that when you walk into a museum, some of the art you're looking at is trying to trick you. <laughs> it is trying to make fun of you in some way. Now, maybe in the history paintings, that doesn't feel like that. But when you're in the modern section, I bet you look at things in there and think, I could do this. Like, what is this? What, what, why is this here? So let's imagine it is today and you walk into a beautiful white gallery in the Contemporary Art Museum and you see this. Would you think, wow, that's a really beautiful dresser? Or would you think, what am I not getting? Is, there, is the artist making fun of me? Did I not go to school? Should I read the label? What, what kind of social commentary is this cabinet making? Well, in my studio, I actually have this on the wall. The idea that art is completely unscrutable, inscrutable and not able to be understood by normals is like a cultural meme, right? This understand modern art instantly breath spray. Everyone looks at that and go, oh, I get it. I don't get art. Uh, no one can get art. It's stupid, right? That's what this is about. Uh, so that makes me mad as someone who makes art. So actually, I think the term visual culture is easier to understand than art. In fact, I teach in a program called MFA, Illustration and Visual Culture. If you think of how big is the bubble that includes visual culture, what is bigger, visual culture's bubble or art's bubble? Visual culture is much bigger. Visual culture, a little subset of that is art, and the rest of it is like, you know, Chinese food menus and baseball cards and tractor tires and basketballs. Like, human beings make a lot of things and they all say something unique. In fact, I like to tell people when you look at the world, whether it's through visual culture or an art museum, to think about these two big buckets, mystery and clarity. These are two values that God loves. God loves clarity and he loves mystery. 
And in fact, that's why I think art is so special. Art is this enchanted intersection where you can dump those two things together simultaneously. And art as a container is this thing that can do a particular activity in your mind that no other container can do. And in fact, if we think about these two poles of mystery and clarity, you can actually walk into an art museum and examine work through those two poles. So like, for instance, in the idea of mystery, here's an example. You may see this in a gallery, this rocking chair by Pontus Wilfors, and think, what does this mean? I don't know what it means either. It's extremely mysterious object, right? It seems to heighten our ability to both look at an object that we use, but also remember the place that it came from. It seems to be growing itself back into a forest. Or here's another example of mystery, Andy Goldsworthy's amazing photos, where he goes into the woods and constructs these sculptures out of things, photographs them, and then they decay. Or if you think, how can art promote clarity? I actually think this is what my section of the universe does in illustration and storytelling. Like this amazing image from Norman Rockwell, who is often derided as sort of this guy who drew an America that never existed in soda shops and Coke bottles, but in fact was very interested in helping people see something they could not see before. Um, this from the, the last uh, part of his career. Or this cover of The New Yorker by Chris Ware, where this is just a humble illustration, but it's showing the same location on Thanksgiving, 50, 80 years apart, and how much has changed and how much stays the same. Or even this extremely complicated diagram of the federal government, which is trying to take something that is unseeable and make it seen. That is an act of clarity. That's actually, I think, what my work is. This book about Dietrich Bonhoeffer, I'm trying to take a story, and of course this is meant for 12-year-olds, uh, right? I mean, now, a lot of adults have read it and said, you know what, I never understood how Hitler came to power before, and you kind of made it sense, so maybe I need to go back to seventh grade. No, everyone learns better with pictures, okay? Just embrace it. Every novel should have pictures. Everything we do should have images in it. So I'm just giving you a way to learn about history that's kind of like a comic book and kind of like a textbook. So if we look back on this mystery and clarity idea, sometimes there is art that does both at the same time. And I actually think that's the best kind of art. Uh, I actually draw all the time. I draw in church. It's one of my favorite activities. Uh, I, I listen to the sermon. And now I'm not a psycho. I don't color these in the pew. I don't have like an easel or anything. But I have my little sketchbook and I listen. I don't plan anything out. I improvise. I listen to the sermon and I react. Just like who's taking improv? What's the number one rule of improv? Yes and. That's right. So when I'm drawing, I just say yes. Whatever is coming out of that preacher's mouth, I'm drawing it. And I react to it and I make an image. And to me, this is as fun as drawing gets. And then when I get home, I, I color them later. Now, actually, this looks like every time I sit down and draw, I get an amazing image, which, of course, is true. I've never made anything bad in my life. No, actually, I, I'm cheating. I'm showing you, like, my favorite, you know, 15 out of hundreds of these. So sometimes they work, and sometimes they don't. But again, what it is doing is the act of drawing. I don't know if you're like this, but everyone who's drawing right now, instead of listening to me, I'm with you. Because when I watch someone talk, I just, my mind floats away. But when my hand is moving, I can lock in. I can key into what I'm listening in a deeper way. And I, I, I don't know why that is, but I think it is part of my calling, the way God made me. Wow, these just keep going, don't they? Anyway, I, I love drawing. And when your thing you love, the passion that you have in your life becomes your career, there is a danger of it becoming kind of a mercenary. Right, of something you stop loving because it's paying the bills. So for me, drawing in church is the way I remember what I love about drawing. I connect to that thing that made me want to be an artist when I was a kid to begin with. So we're back to mystery and clarity again. The one thing that unifies both mystery and clarity at the same time is, of course, 
beauty. Beauty is inside both of those things. But they're so, it's sort of beauty of an opposite kind. Okay, so I've convinced you that you need art. I bet what you think we need is some Christian art, right? Whatever kind of art you make, it always gets better if you put Christian in front of it, right? Um, okay, so Christian art. Close your eyes. What do you think of when I say Christian art? Do you think of the Sistine Chapel? I really hope you do. That's a very good example, at least in a Western context, of Christian art making. But of course, you could also be thinking, the, a Christian art has a very wide cultural footprint. And unfortunately, if we left the confines of this room and went out into the greater world, I teach at a school called Washington University in St. Louis, Christian art as a category is going to be more like this than the Sistine Chapel in their mind. But I want to also tell you that this is also Christian art. This is by Makoto Fujimura. I love this painting. Now, let's imagine you walk into a gallery and see this painting. How long do you look at it? What do you see here? Are you lost? Are you thinking, my kid could do this? <laughs> this, and in fact, Looking at art in books and on slides and in textbooks for so many years has hurt all of us in the ability to appreciate art. If you see this in the gallery, the thing you would notice is that this is a shimmering canvas. It is made of hundreds of glazes of precious metals, platinum, gold, silver. It absolutely like glimmers in kind of holographic delight. So this painting this is that beautiful 18th century cabinet in the gallery. This is the thing that when we look at it, we should pause and reflect on that beauty. Not to understand it, not to explain it, but to just behold it. That is part of what thoughtful looking is all about. In fact, um, one of the lovely things about art that we understand when we see it on screen the difference between that and when we look at it in person is the same phenomenon when we try to photograph fireworks. Have you ever seen all these people videoing fireworks? It, it makes no sense to me. No one ever watches those videos again, I guarantee it. And also I love the, actually this is, I stole this from Mako. Mako says, if you love fireworks, you will love abstract art. Now let's think about it. What are the reactions when you watch fireworks? Woo! Whoa! That is what your response should be when you walk into a gallery. People do not look at fireworks and say, what does it mean? I don't get it. My kid could do that. Right? There is, an, a, there is a sense that we are being overwhelmed with non-representational awe. And I actually think that is one thing we can all just tuck into the back of our minds when we walk into a gallery and we don't understand what we're looking at. Just look at it. Just look at the sensations of color, of light, of form, and try to enjoy it. Uh, I don't, this is like the original viral video in, in my mind. This is Double Rainbow. Who has seen Double Rainbow? Okay, thank goodness. The kids are going to be all right. I feel like this is now like a 15-year-old uh, <laughs> video. We, now, we couldn't get this to play, but I am begging you to go watch Double Rainbow. What happens in this video is... Uh, this young man is walking through the woods, he's camping, and he walks through a clearing, and he sees a double rainbow, and it goes all the way across the sky. And he loses his mind. And the most amazing thing about this video is it starts with absolute wonder and awe. And he's laughing, and he's saying, a double rainbow all the way. It looks like a triple rainbow. And then he begins to cry. He cries at the majesty of this triple rainbow. And then at the very end of the video, he says, what does it mean? I love that part. It's like, that is what art should do to us. It's beautiful. It makes me cry. I don't understand it. God, what does this symbol mean? And, I mean, this young man was not coming at it with a godly worldview. He was coming at it with a human worldview. I am being awed by something in front of me. And I got to ask the question, what does it mean? Because ultimately, underneath that question... What do I mean? And that's what we're all doing when we make things. We're all asking the question, what do I mean? 
So one thing I love about art is this idea. Now, this comes from C.S. Lewis. When, when uh, C.S. Lewis, who wrote the Narnia books, was an atheist for a majority of his young life. Uh, he read a book called Fantasties by George MacDonald. It was a fairy tale. And something about it, he said later, in that book, baptized his imagination. The art ex itself, the experience of this art, it was not a gospel story. It was not about Jesus. But it is a story about crossing a threshold from one place to another, that thing that we long to go, basically the threshold that became evident in Lewis's later works, from our world to Narnia. That crossing felt so real to him, so desirable. He longed for that fairy tale land to be true, and in his heart it awoke something, something of a longing for a thing that was not found on earth. And he later said, art baptizes our imaginations. So if we take these two things, we've got mystery, we've got clarity, and we put them together, you know, it's kind of this thing of like, well, is it, you know, 50% of one, 50% of the other, 49, 51? Uh, no, even when we put them together, the idea of gestalt comes into play. Has anyone ever heard of the word gestalt? This is an art school term. Gestalt means the whole is more than the sum of its parts. And it's one of the things I love about illustration because in illustration, actually, you need both text an image for illustration to work. And the book, like The Faithful Spy, is neither only text nor only image. It is both of those things together. And in the middle of those things, a new third thing is made that is neither word nor image. And I think that's what it's like to look at art. You get this gestalt that is just more than the sum of its parts. You get to close something, close meaning in your mind, put together two things that are not there and see something greater. So uh, art, I like to tell people, is just, if you want to boil it down, what is art? It's a conduit for seeing. It gives you the ability to see as someone else does for just a moment, whether that's in a story or a poem or a painting or a graphic novel. We get to inhabit inside the skin of another person for just a few moments. It's a way of kind of incarnating ourselves into the story of others. Now, Tim Keller has an amazing analogy he uses when he talks about Christian art. Now, Mako Fujimura, who made that amazing abstract uh, painting, he would not call himself a Christian artist. He's an artist who is a Christian. And Tim Keller uses this framework that I've often used. This is really helpful. How do we make art as a Christian? Well, if these glasses were Jesus, you can put the glasses on the table and draw an image of them, beautiful photo representational image. Or, of course, you can put the glasses on and draw what you see through them. And, of course, what you see through them is not literal Jesus, but a world that is shaped and colored and toned by Christ himself. So as you leave today, maybe here's a few things you can think about. Uh, again, I love talking about drawing. I love talking about God. And if I can give you one piece of advice, um, if you think you're not a drawer, I think you should be a drawer. Keep a sketchbook. Keep a tiny little notebook in your pocket. Keep a pen. Of course, everyone's like, I like to draw on my phone. Great, I love drawing on my phone too. But there is something about the somatic activity, that means bodily activity, of making with ink on paper. So drawing, drawing simply is just a way of thinking. And so I think all of us, instead of working and focusing on just making beautiful images, using images as a way to communicate what is inside our hearts and minds. All right. Thank you, everyone.